Good morning and welcome to Collaborative Statistics. Today we are going to talk about Chapter 9, Hypothesis Testing of a single mean or a single proportion. Now you're wonder, probably wondering why we're doing single means and single proportions and why not all of them. Next chapter we start talking about two, so it's going to build from here. We're going to start with the single one because it's the simplest and then we're going to go from there where we start looking at two or, or more uh, things. So what is the hypothesis test? It's um, something we use to determine whether uh, we have a hypothesis, we, we have an idea about something, and is it a reasonable statement? Uh, can it be rejected or um, you know, is it a reasonable statement that can't be rejected or is it an unreasonable and should be rejected? So we're going to be looking at stuff and trying to determine, you know, should th is this true? Is this a lie or not? Um, we never accept the hypothesis. Okay, we always either reject or fail to reject. So when we start this, we set it up. We have a null hypothesis, which is uh, one thing that so this one always has an equal sign in it, um, and the alternative uh, is always either you know is the opposite. So um, the null hypothesis will have uh, less than or equal to, equal to, or greater than or equal to, and the alternative would then have the opposite thing. So we would have greater than, not equal, or less than. All right. So there's never an equal sign in the alternative hypothesis or the claim. Um, so this is usually the thing we're trying to to, to come across because we want to we we would like to be able to reject the null hypothesis and therefore show val validity for the alternative. Um, you know, it's not always the case, but in, that's how it usually ends up working. Um, so <coughs> now we reject the null hypothesis or do not reject the null hypothesis. Reject or do not reject. There is no accept. You know, very Yodish. Uh, so. uh, there are errors that come along with this. Um, we have this thing we, we build in, it's called alpha. This is a type 1 error. Um, so this is when we uh, reject the null hypothesis but it was actually true. All right. um, and we try to reduce that by our significance level. So uh, we try to make this as small as possible. Um, it just means that we need to be more accurate because as we learned in um, chapter uh, 8 when we had um, sig uh, confidence intervals, you know, the smaller the uh, the larger the confidence interval, the smaller the alpha, because that was the other part, and therefore the z values move out further. So we have to, you know, show that there's going to be to, and for us to reject these null hypotheses, they have to fall into that alpha. So those are going to be smaller pieces. So therefore, we have to show that they're going to be really difficult to to prove. Um, the other error is type two, which is when we uh, don't reject. But the hypothesis, um, so we don't reject, and the hypothesis is actually false. So we should have rejected it. Uh, we can't calculate this um, this value, but it does exist. Um, a lot of times they talk about these two things in types of in um, the idea of a jury trial, where uh, you convict the person and they were innocent. Or you find you fail to convict the person and they were guilty. So those are you know ideas about how um, type one and type two errors can be related to real world. Um, so we will always have a sample. Okay, we this is how it works because we are testing to see is the um, population. Because uh, we're always looking at this and the, the hypothesis test on a population, we're trying to take a sample idea, a, a group, and base it upon the population. And say, well, gee, if this sample, you know, falls into that, then then everything else must fall in. But if it if this sample doesn't show the population what we expected to be true, then the popula our our assumption probably isn't true. Okay, and that's why we have error because we're using the sample to, you know expand out onto the population. Um, and so one of the things we're going to calculate is a p-value. Now this is just a new term 
<coughs> for an older concept. Uh, we've been doing this since chapter 6. We've been finding that we take the z-score and we were finding that probability that, that the um, the space under the curve that is now called the p-value. Okay, so it's not just no longer just a probability. See, probability value, p-value. They've actually you know shortened it and it's turned it into a, its own term. So uh, we have a z-score and we look it up on a chart or we use our calculators and do the C uh, p uh, the normal CDFs. That probability that we found was really the p-value. Okay, um, so the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence. Okay, so if we find p-values that are, if we get z-scores that are, you know, four and five and six and thirteen, we're going to have p-values that are close to zero, and therefore um, they are going to be smaller than any alpha that we could uh, have. All right, they're very far out liars. Okay, and so therefore. They must be saying something. They must be saying something about the mean or the proportion, um, it being not what we thought it would be supposed to be. And we should always draw a graph, just like we did with all the rest of the stuff. We draw a graph so we can figure out um, where do these p-values lie. Sorry, I don't know why I'm yawning today. <clears throat> and um, you'll see that we're going to have what they call one and two-tailed tests. That just depends upon. Uh, what our null and alternatives are, but do the p-values fall in or out of those spaces? And it kind of helps us visualize and, and solve it. So uh, these are the formulas we're going to use again. We're also going to use a z-score. You know, z is equal to the um, average minus the mean. You know, the sample the sample mean minus the population mean, our assumed population mean divided by the standard deviation over the square root of n. So for a z-score or for a t-score, well, look, oh, we have the mean of the population with the mean of the sample minus the mean of the population over the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And remember, we're going to use degrees of freedom in this, so n minus 1 degrees of freedom still for the t. <coughs> okay, so we're still going to be using the same things we've been using in the last two chapters. Uh, we're just now actually using them for the tests. So. Um, Decisions, all right, and conclusions. So we're going to compare our p-value to our alpha. All right, if alpha is bigger than the p-value, we reject the null hypothesis. If it's less than or equal to it, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Seems pretty simple. It's just a rule. You do those two things, you'll be fine. <coughs> okay. Um, don't forget they talk about sometimes if it's a two-tail test we have to um, multiply the p-value by two. Um, so we, those are things we have to look at because we've cut alpha in half. So, um, or we can divide by alpha over two. But in the book, I think they use the multiply the p-value by two. All right, to get to compare it to alpha. So if you have a two-tail test, you're going to multiply the p-values by two, and I'll show you that in a second. So, remember, we do not reject the null hypothesis. It means that um, is not the same thing as HO being true, because we could we have error in there, and we might have made a mistake. Okay, it just means that our sample data doesn't have enough information to show that it, it's not true. Because you know, remember, these are samples, so we could always change our samples, and uh, we may have to get more data. So when Companies are looking to test some medicine and see if it's work, if it you know creates, if it's um, you know if it works faster or more effective or um, stops the bleeding faster. You know they have a small sample they may start with, okay, and they don't have enough data, so they may get a bigger sample and a bigger sample and a bigger sample, and then they realize, oh well, you know our product isn't really as good as we thought it was. So those are the things they do. You know, they have to. They always want to take. You know, samples. The, you can always do more samples, or do another sample and do another one and see are these things. You know, is it go true over time? Okay. So we always want to test things more than once. Um, or we should always write our answers in a complete sentence. So these are. This is where English comes in. So a conclusion uh, has information about your decision about the hypothesis, whether you're going to reject or not reject. Um, you're going to use the information about the problem, including sample size and significance level, because those are important. Otherwise, people don't know why you um, uh, did, came up with what you did, because they're just going to say, oh, reject. 
the hypothesis. Well, they don't know what the null hypothesis is. They don't know how big your sample was. <coughs> Sorry. Um, they don't know how what your significance level was because you know they may have done it and said, oh, well, gee, I used a, uh, an alpha of 0.1. Where did you use an alpha of 0.01? And so you know things change. So this is kind of what it would look like. You know, based upon a sample size of n, we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Oops, I should say null hypothesis. Uh, that mu or p, depending on whether we're using a mean or population, is less than, greater than, whatever, equal to uh, some number at the blank level of significance. So, you know, these are basically this is basically the sentence that you're going to use minus that little stub up there. I should say null. Uh, I got to fix that. Um, so is it a left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed? And so this tells us whether or not we're going to be multiplying um, by two or not. So if I have greater than, well, my less than, notice, is right here. This is the p-value. I only have one p-value that I'm working at. Is it is the, al al no, it is the alternative hypothesis greater than? Well, that's going to be over here. So if I have values that are you know less than 0.2, I would fail to reject. If I have something that is greater than 0.2 over here, I'm going, you know, if I have values that are over here, I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. If I have an equal sign, well then I have things that could fall on either side and I would reject. This is why we have to multiply our p-value that we get by 2, because we have two p-values that we're looking at. We've cut this in half. Um, and then compare that to alpha because this is really alpha over two over here and this is alpha over two over here. So we have to, you know, take into account both pieces. So that's why in your book you do that. In the books that I used to do, we just compared it to alpha over two. You know, and it's because we we drew our graphs and we said, oh, it fell over in here. You know, I can you know solve that. So. But you know, in the book when we're writing it down, they want you to use alpha always. So therefore, your p-value has to be multiplied by two. It's kind of a, you know, one and a half dozen of one, six of the other. So either way, you will reject or not. You'll come up with the same answer. And so these are the steps. So you state your null and alternative hypotheses. What is the test statistics? Are we going to use a z or a t-score? All right. Um, what is the rejection? We do draw a graph. All right. Is it left, or right, or two-tailed? Is the, where are the critical values? Where is our alpha? You know, so we're going to take our alpha. If it's a one-tailed, we can figure out what those values are in a z-score. If it's a two, if it's a t-test, we look it up on the chart. We come up with the, if the two. Is it alpha over two that we have to cut because we had a um, we have a two-tailed test? So we figure out all those little pieces. That's why we draw our picture. All right. Then we do the math. <coughs> You know, um, we calculate our p-value. You know, so we have to do the formulas. You know, come up with the thing. In your calculator, you're just going to plunge all those numbers in and hit calculate, and it's going to give you an answer. It's going to give you information for the p-value. Uh, we then compare that p-value to our alpha. Okay, and if p-value is less than alpha, reject. If the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, do not reject. Then write up your conclusion. Okay, so this is the same problem. The way you're gonna do the problem every single time, over and over and over again. It's just steps. Make sure you do all of them. And that's it. I will see you in class. Bye.